As humans, we like to classify things. We like for objects to have a very specific definition that can be easily applied to other objects of similar kind. But in nature, or I guess pretty much in the rest of the universe, things are not as easy. The universe doesn't like classifications. It tends to create things that always break certain rules. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about one such example of another broken classification when it comes to brown dwarfs. The universe once again showed us examples that seem to make no sense. Very strange and very unusual brown dwarfs that were recently discovered in one of the studies. But because the brown dwarfs themselves already sort of break a lot of classification rules, it makes this especially intriguing and especially difficult to analyze and difficult to study. For example, today we don't really even have a very good definition for what a brown dwarf technically is. We know that it's an object that's more massive than a typical gas giant, but an object that's not massive enough to be a star. But there's no specific definition for what exactly this mass is, or for what makes a planet a planet, or a brown dwarf a brown dwarf. Or if we were to even go further, what exactly makes a certain object a brown dwarf and not a star? Ok, to be more precise, here's what we have so far. Everything up to approximately 12 masses of Jupiter normally remains a planet. And I say normally because there are obviously some exceptions to this rule. But once an object reaches the mass of about 12 masses of Jupiter and possibly 13 masses of Jupiter, because of the pressure and because of the presence of a lot of radioactive elements on the inside, it tends to acquire just enough temperature to initiate the certain type of a fusion reaction. The reaction referred to as deuterium fusion. Deuterium in this case is an isotope of hydrogen. The isotope containing one single neutron on the inside sticking next to the proton. Also when you get two neutrons you get something known as tritium. But because deuterium is much more rare, the fusion reaction in this case does not actually produce a lot of heat. It produces some heat, but not a lot of it. Nevertheless, this sort of transforms the planet, the gas giant, into something a little bit hotter and something that very likely has slightly different contents on the inside. Simply because of all of this fusion going on and simply because of the sudden increase in the lot of heat generated. And so by today's definition, this would be a brown dwarf. Now it's not brown in color though. In the beginning their color might be something similar to what you see right here. But more massive brown dwarfs become a little bit hotter and thus transform their color as well. The hottest ones we've found so far sort of look like smaller M-type stars, or basically like red dwarfs, and they do possess very similar colors, so it's sometimes somewhat difficult to tell them apart. But there's another difficulty when it comes to brown dwarfs. At some point, specifically somewhere I guess right here, once they acquire approximately 65 masses of Jupiter, they also have a chance to start burning lithium. And though it doesn't produce as much energy as hydrogen, it still produces some energy. And this right here is also used as a kind of a secondary confirmation that what we're looking at is possibly a brown dwarf. Because it turns out that for example stars like our sun, or some of the smaller stars um, that have been stars for at least a billion years, will normally contain no lithium almost at all. The hydrogen fusion in this case will actually get rid of pretty much most of the lithium, and once the high enough temperature is reached, Pretty much all of the lithium is depleted within only a few million years. And so in astronomy there is something known as the lithium test. In this case it refers to looking at the star and seeing if there's any lithium inside of it. Normally if there's lithium and it's an object that sort of resembles a red dwarf, it will usually be a brown dwarf, not really a star. And that's because it's burning lithium but doesn't have enough temperature and mass to burn hydrogen. But the vast majority of brown dwarfs, including the closest brown dwarfs to us, known as Loman 16a and b, are not massive enough to burn lithium and thus usually do not really have anything to show us. They'll still have some lithium in the atmosphere, but it's going to be practically invisible. And so this already creates a bit of a problem in defining what brown dwarfs are. So I guess some of them have deuterium burning, some of them have lithium burning, but there's no one definition. At the same time, in terms of the actual mass, it's also not very well defined. Depending on what materials they're made out of, and also depending on what exactly happens in their atmosphere and inside of them, they might or might not begin deuterium burning and lithium burning. Moreover, the more important question is, when do they actually start being stars and not brown dwarfs? At the moment, this is really the most difficult part of the definition. 
it's believed that the mass, the maximum mass of a brown dwarf is about 80 masses of Jupiter. And that's pretty much what I've seen everywhere, in every single textbook, in every definition, and most astronomers seem to agree with this value. So this means that anything more massive than 80 masses of Jupiter technically is a star, because it becomes massive and hot enough to start burning hydrogen and to get rid of all of the lithium that was present there. But once again, here's the problem. The problem coming from the recent study you can find in the description below. In this study, the scientists identified several stars containing what seems to be really massive brown dwarfs, finding five objects specifically that were really pushing the boundaries of this definition. Because technically, because of the mass of each of these objects, they really should be stars. But they don't seem to be stars. So all of these objects were identified by the TESS mission. All of them are what's known as TESS objects of interest. Their exact names are listed right here in the study. But their masses are quite unique. The least massive of them is 77 masses of Jupiter. But the most massive is 98 times the mass of Jupiter. And that is something we've actually never seen before. That's a mass of a typical red dwarf star. But this one doesn't seem to be a red dwarf star. And one of the reasons is actually because of the radii. The radius is somewhat similar to Jupiter as well, between about 0.8 to about 1.6 radii of Jupiter. Now one thing that makes brown dwarfs different from stars is that as they get older, they burn up their deuterium and because of this their actual size shrinks, they become smaller and smaller. And this is precisely what the scientists discovered with these brown dwarfs. The oldest ones were also the smallest ones. Stars on the other hand do the opposite, they grow in size with time. And so here the scientists are definitely not certain exactly what they're looking at. Now they obviously could be some sort of unusual red dwarfs resembling brown dwarfs, possibly containing a little bit of lithium left over from before, which by the way has been seen in some of the previous young stars. But based on the size measurements, they don't seem to qualify as stars. They seem to be much smaller than a typical red dwarf. Now specifically, this is actually something to do with electron degeneracy. And so here's how it works for some of the more massive brown dwarfs. Once they reach a certain mass, usually about 60 to maybe 80 masses of Jupiter, their total size becomes governed by what's known as electron degeneracy pressure. Something that we usually see in a lot of white dwarfs as well. So basically the electrons in this case prevent the object from collapsing more. But as it acquires more mass, the object becomes smaller and smaller in size. Although this is only for the more massive brown dwarfs. For the ones that are less than 50 masses of Jupiter, usually they are similar to planets. With more mass, they sort of expand a little bit and become bigger and bigger in size. So once again, yet another problem to add to the definition. And so normally at a certain point, once enough mass is reached, they will actually start transforming again, becoming smaller and smaller in size. And in some cases, the more massive brown dwarfs will actually start compressing themselves so much that the lithium burning on the inside accelerates quite dramatically, eventually burning completely in about 10 million years, which means that they start cooling down much quicker. And so the more massive brown dwarfs might actually even be cooler than their least massive partners. And what makes this even more intriguing is that in some cases, these scientific studies even predict what's known as iron rain that could be prominent in pretty much most of the more massive brown dwarfs. As a matter of fact, detecting iron in the atmosphere of a typical object would almost certainly indicate that we're looking at a brown dwarf and not a star. For example, the nearest brown dwarfs to us, Loman 16, they seem to have iron rain in their atmosphere, suggesting that they're definitely brown dwarfs. But this still does not explain how certain objects, the most massive brown dwarfs, can still stay as brown dwarfs and not turn into stars. Or essentially what exactly is happening with these five objects. They seem to be extremely massive, they have enough mass to initiate the burning of hydrogen, yet they seem to possess brown dwarf features, along with some other unusual features never seen before. So because these particular brown dwarfs are orbiting other stars and are not just objects traveling by themselves, it was discovered that at least one of them is extremely hot because of the star. The object known as Toy 587 seems to be the hottest star to have a brown dwarf partner. The temperature here is nearly 10,000 Kelvin, with the brown dwarf itself also having extremely hot temperatures on the surface. The other brown dwarfs are influenced by their stars in other ways, for example orbital circulation, tidal effects and a lot of tidal locking as well. And so one potential explanation for why these brown dwarfs are not stars and why they remained in their brown dwarf form 
is maybe because the star did not allow them. Maybe the star's influence in this case, specifically the gravitational influence, prevented these brown dwarfs from starting their own hydrogen fusion. We don't really know how yet, but maybe that's just one of the explanations here. Although honestly, at the moment, this is really not a question anyone can answer. These are definitely some of the most mysterious and most unusual brown dwarfs discovered in the last few years. And so in the end, what's the conclusion from all of this? Well, the conclusion is that, once again, the universe doesn't really like classifications. There are always going to be exceptions to the rule, and there are always going to be things that just don't meet our criteria. In this case, these brown dwarfs, they seem to be brown dwarfs, but they also seem to have their own features. And also what we call a brown dwarf right now is a very vague term. It seems to sort of classify a lot of objects that seem to have their own things going. Some of them are burning deuterium, some of them are burning lithium, and some of them might have something entirely different. Which also of course means that we are going to be learning so much more about these objects in the years to come. But for now that's all I wanted to mention. Check out the study in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.